all possible situations when we use a mirror or a lens to form an image of an object. If you look closely, you can see very interesting <coughs> patterns. For example, I don't know, here, this one. This image is virtual, and uh, on the opposite side relative to the device. Yeah. Do we see any other images like that? No. <clears throat> this is on the other side of the device, but it's real. Um, this one is virtual on the other side, but if we compare, actually this one is smaller, and uh, if you look at the images formed by these devices, you can see that the location, the size, and the orientation of the image immediately tells us what device was used to form it. <clears throat> For example, this one is also larger, also virtual, but it's on the same side with the object relative to the device. And we don't see any other images like that. That's the only one. So if we know the characteristics of an image, we know how it's been formed. <clears throat> so for example, what do you think is being used here to form that particular image? So for our convenience, we can see all possible options, but eventually it's a time-saving technique to transfer all those pictures into the memory. It's not really conceptual, it's just saving time. So, <clears throat> An image, we see it, it's upright and on another side, smaller than the object. Out of eight pictures, do we see a picture like that? So if you see a picture like that, you should pick a device which forms that image and in this situation, what is that? What is that? This is how I'm asking always broadly. So let's see. <clears throat> we need a smaller, not at all, not at all, larger, smaller. Now we have to check also smaller, also on another side, but uh, inverted, so doesn't work. That's the picture. That's how it works. And uh, <clears throat> when we know any information about an image, we always can find out what kind of a device was used to form it. And then we can draw a diagram, throw an equations, and uh, solve it. Well, next question. What do you think about this <coughs> situation? So we have solved several problems with mirrors responsible for the formation of an image. Now we got to do a couple of more examples when a lens is responsible for formation of an image. The same object actually. I'm watching. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Everyone, everyone's supposed to be doing this, All right? A diagram. We cannot answer. Well, 
this statement is too strong. We could have answered the question without a diagram or picture, but we shouldn't. We should follow the 100 years old procedure in physics, which always begins from drawing a picture which represents what's happening. <clears throat> and uh, the simple reason for that is physics is about actual phenomena. So ideally, we should have been running many, many experiments for all possible situations, but we can't. We don't have an equipment, we don't have time, so we have to replace an actual experiment with a thought experiment, and that requires using our imagination, using our ability to transfer what we see inside our brain into what other people can see outside on the paper. And uh, in this situation, again, it's, uh, it's starting from drawing, drawing the principal axis. Now, again, we don't draw an actual lens. We just indicate its location and its type. It's here, and converging. So an actual lens would look like this in the air, or like this, or like this. As long as it's thicker in the middle, it will converge light. But we just show an indication of how those surfaces would have been you know, seen. Now, next, focal length. Focal length. It's 30 centimeters, and uh, bless you. An object is placed 15 centimeters. That's the most important part of a picture. Where should we draw an object? And uh, so in general, we can break the half of a space from the lens to the left in three regions from infinity to doubled focal distance, between doubled focal distance and the focal distance, and between focal distance and the lens. That's why we have three cases for one lens. So we have to read numbers, 30, 15. 15 is shorter, so it's here. This is an object. That's the first part of a diagram. Second part is choosing two rays, drawing two rays, see where, where, we have an image and answer the question. And the survey says, uh, forgetting first. So, <clears throat> the ray number one, we always choose the ray number one to travel toward the lens parallel to the principal axis because after it travels through the lens, how does it go? Through the focal point. Point number one, point number two, we need to connect these two points. Uh, ray number two or three, people do it differently. I always recommend draw a ray which goes through the middle of the lens because it doesn't bend. It remains straight. <clears throat> now you have to copy the picture. And now Uh, I need someone 
to keep the track of numbers of questions because I'm remembering the questions right now. Question number three. The image is real, image is virtual. Same problem, same question. I want you to answer it again. Hmm? See, that's why I asked someone to keep track of numbering. Four, thank you. Same question, just different number, please. Bless you. So, same question. Same object, same optical device, same distances. Yes, it was three, four. All my numbering goes off. All right, let's see. Uh, I see. Come on, what's happening today again? Do. So you answered, so first of all, I had only 19 before. Now I want to have more. So that was question number three, almost 50-50. This is question number four. And we can see how the distribution changed into the favor of the correct answer. <coughs> so this was an experimental proof of the fact that picture helps. That's it. So initially, for the question number three, we had 50-50 distribution. Now, <coughs> more people said correctly that this image shouldn't be real. These rays do not converge. A real image only formed by actual light rays when they converge somewhere. This will be an image of this object. And then that's the most important part of the reasoning. Now we can just throw numbers in and just solve it. So 1 divided by f equals 1 divided by do plus 1 divided by di, 1 divided by Theory should be equal to 1 divided by 15 plus 1 divided by di. Do you actually recognize this equation? We have it solved before. Bless you. Exactly the same equation. So that's going to be 1 over 30 minus 1 over 15, which is 1 minus 2 over 30, which is negative 1 over 30. And now the i equals negative 30. First of all, my picture is not very accurate because technically 30 centimeters is here. So an image in this particular situation turns out to be located right at the focal point. Well, whatever, centimeters. <coughs> It's negative. See, people sometimes confuse when the image distance should be negative. They say sometimes if it's on the left, it's positive. If it's on the right, it's negative. If you think so, that's not the rule. The rule says if the image is virtual, the image distance is negative, no matter where we can see it. If the image is real, the distance is positive. 
So not the location, not the orientation, virtuality or reality is important. And now, of course, we can, uh, <coughs> so that's the answer. Now, of course, we can calculate the size. We just use the same equation for the magnification. And uh, it is larger than the object and positive because it is upright above the principal axis. That's it. Any questions? This is, again, a very uh, standard way of reasoning, which actually not different at all from the way of reasoning we used for mirrors. So please use it again and uh, answer this question, which now is number five. So. All right, to force you into drawing a diagram, well, you know what I'm going to ask you to do, right? To draw a diagram, <coughs> take out the phone out of your pocket or backpack, take a picture of your diagram, email it to me. By the way, for people who will watch it later, I took pictures of these names. I have to. It's my responsibility to keep track. Nothing personal. <clears throat> All right. Please, draw a picture. Take a phone. Take a picture of your picture. Send the picture of your picture. Of course, if you have any questions, you should uh, act, ask a question. Now, a general advice is, as you remember, draw a relatively large picture. A small picture <sighs> might be not very clear. So a good picture is a large picture. And a large picture normally would take like at least a quarter of a page. At least. So the rule is a good picture is a big picture. Plus, you have probably noticed already, since we're going to draw many, many diagrams, it's handy to have like a ruler or something straight. So you could draw accurately straight lines here at home on the exam. It's no secret. Since we've spent so much time on this topic, it's going to be at least one problem related to diagrams. <coughs> it's only logical. All right, let's check. All right, I'm getting emails. Now let's see your answers. That's question five. Uh, keep forgetting. Switch the mode. Resend. Resend credentials. Fourteen. That can't be enough yet. Fourteen is not enough. So that was question number four.
I mean number three, this is number four. So this is number five. Well, we're getting somewhere. So, <clears throat> a diagram. Very important mental process, translating words into a pictorial representation of the situation. But the steps are always the same. Principal axis, the location of a lens. Now, the lens. Now, what type of the lens? We know with diversion lens in air is thinner in the middle, thicker on the edges. So this is how we show this fact. Uh, also should have uh, points, focal points, and uh, uh, now, so that's 30, that's supposed to be 60. And this is where we place uh, an object. 60, okay. And uh, now we got to start drawing rays. So I choose always one ray which travels toward the optical device parallel to the principal axis, and the second one which travels through. And uh, the one which travels through is the easiest one. We know it's never, it never bends, so it just gets through. So the real question is, what should happen to this ray? And uh, <clears throat> depending on how you answer that question, your picture is right or wrong, and everything else depends on that. So naturally, for any ray, for any ray traveling through any optical device, we have only three options. Doesn't bend, bends toward the principal axis, or bends away from the principal axis. Only three. Nothing else might happen. So we have to keep in mind our choices then to make a correct choice. So which would you choose? First, second, or third? First, because, because what is that single word which tells us what should happen to this ray? One single word. Hmm? No. The word which we read on the screen, diversion. Diversion means bending away from a principal axis. So, not this, not this. Well, now we also have to be very careful that would have been too much bending because we also know the rule that the extension of that ray should go through the focal point. So this is here plus a diversion lens never ever can form a real image. That's it. That's the difference between conversion lenses and diversion lenses. A conversion lens might form a real image or might form a virtual image, depending on the location of an object. But the diversion lens can't ever form a real image. This is a virtual image, which is upright, smaller. And now, of course, we can start writing numbers and uh, Can't move on, I have to stop.
Why did I stop? What do you think? Anyone? Yes? That's why I stopped. I made a mistake. <coughs> All right. Let's make it official. Wrong. But it's a simple thing to correct it because it's a diversion lens. Focal distance must be negative. Now we can solve it. <sighs> Let's add a slide. Negative 1 over 30 minus 1 over 60, 1 over di. Negative uh, 2 plus 1 over 60. Three twenty. Right? The plus. That's it. If we keep... Uh, uh, remember, there was a slide with all agreements. What, when things should be positive, when things should be negative. If you pay attention to that, if we keep that rule, that's it. So, well, again, my picture is not very accurate. Because, well, actually, more or less, that's 20 centimeters. And uh, it's supposed to be smaller, which means, <coughs> again, we just throw the numbers into the equation, calculate, and uh, it is positive because it is upright. Well, uh, so that's a question for you. What do you think about this situation? And uh, we have an object, we have an image, but we don't know uh, what kind of a device is that. And first thing is to figure out what kind of a device is that. So the image is on another side, inverted. <coughs> That's what we see. We don't know yet if it's real or virtual, but that's a part of our reasoning. <coughs> if that would have been a mirror, that would have been a virtual image. But for a mirror, a virtual image, it should be upright. That's not the case. So if we look at all the pictures, that's supposed to be a lens. And uh, a magnification, according to a definition, is always equal to this ratio. That's just a definition. The second part of the equation is not a definition. The second part of the equation has been derived from triangles in the picture. But we don't need the second part. We just need this to answer this question. Because we all only have to use an agreement. We always place an object upright because it's out in our power. Why would we move it differently, place it differently? That's why HO is always positive. But HI depends. When an image is inverted, what's supposed to be uh, the value of this variable equal to some negative number? So a negative number over a positive number. So nothing tr tricky about this. And now we just have to start solving this problem. This is a problem when we are not looking for properties of an image. We're using properties of an image to figure out the properties of other things, like a device. So of course, still we have to start from a diagram. That's my object. 
That's my image. Where is the lens? Well, actually, there is a very simple way to figure it out. There is one ray which doesn't bend when it travels through the center. We just have to draw that ray. That ray should connect the top of an object and, uh, well, the bottom top of an image. We just want to try to do it as accurate as possible, so we would actually not. OK. So that's supposed to be something like this. You got to bring a shorter ruler. <coughs> so we know this ray shouldn't bend. So here we should have the lens. What kind of a lens? A diversion or a conversion? Conversion. <clears throat> For a diversion lens, as we just saw, the image would be a virtual and on the same side. Well, now we can add another ray. It should go like this. We actually don't have to. But uh, it's handy. That's supposed to be the focal point. Now we can start writing equations. So 1 over f equals 1 over do plus 1 over di. And uh, we have to make a choice for the actual value of the focal distance. Should we write a 30 or a negative 30? That depends on this, right? For this length. That's 30. So 1 over 30 equals 1 over, hmm. We cannot solve this equation. It has two unknowns, which means we need one more equation. And we have it for the magnification. That's the definition. This came from geometry, from triangles. You see triangles. I can see at least one, two, three, four, five triangles. And, uh, well, how should I use this equation? Well, I should write 0.5 equals this. Why did I stop? Well, you see, that's what people usually do. They skip part of the reason. First, I stopped because I made a mistake. And the next part of the reasoning, what mistake did I make? Magnification, of course. We just discussed it. So, again, wrong. But is a fix. It has to be negative. Well, physics is done. Yes? Why is M negative? Anybody, please. Yes? Did you, did you hear it? See, you asking two different questions. Why is M negative? That's one question. Why is this a minus? That's a different question. Pick a question. Only one. No, only one. You have to pick one question. Which is more important for you? So these two fractions always would be simultaneously both positive or both negative. 
because if HI is negative and uh, uh, DI is positive, you would have some negative number be equal to positive number, which is impossible. Thank you. That was absolutely correct answer. Well, please take a calculator. We still have office hours ahead if you have more questions. And Piazza, you've never used it, I know. <coughs> Moving on. <coughs> this question is related to the law we've used already several times before, the Snell's law. <coughs> so I, I'm asking you to use it one more time. In this situation, what we have is a ray traveling in a medium with high index or refraction, passes the boundary bit interface, travels into the medium with low index or refraction. That's how we call them. Well, these are specific media, water and air. So <coughs> we got to write the law. Plug the numbers, take a calculator, and calculate it. Less equals more. So less than 76 equals 76. Um, that's the question number six. Seven. What was six? OK, thank you. It doesn't matter. Question number seven. Yes. Three, greater than 76. That's the angle of incidence. So the law says, we know very well, that this product is equal to this product. So we have to pick correctly the name for each medium. The medium number one in this problem, how do we call it? Thank you. So that gives, leaves the error. So now we had to plug the numbers in. So uh, 1.33 times sine 76, 1 times sine. Uh, so now we got to solve it theta to the inverse to sine of uh, 1.33 times sine 76. Now we have to plug it into the calculator. We'll look at the calculator. So what does it say? What does it say? Error. What does it mean? When we had a number for this angle, that meant that light was able to travel through the boundary from one medium into another medium. Now that number doesn't exist. What does it mean? What does logic tell us? Light cannot travel through, another through the boundary into another medium. So, no refraction. If there is no refraction, what's left? What other phenomenon might happen on the boundary, on the interface between two media? 
reflection. So in this situation, in this situation, light can't travel through. It must completely be reflected back into original medium. So this phenomenon has a name, total internal reflection, because the light gets totally reflected back into the medium number one. But that's not happening at any arbitrary angles. And actually, we have seen it last time, so let's just take a quick look one more time. Total internal reflection. The podium. The mysterious liquid. The laser pointer. Okay. But right now, it goes out. Well, right now, it gets reflected. There has, there has to be a critical angle between these two different regimes. So how do we find it? Well, <clears throat> it's actually a very simple task. When so medium number one and one and two and and one must be greater than n two and uh, when angles are relatively small, light does travel through theta one theta two when angles are large enough oops. That's what starts happening. So the critical angle is when light supposedly travels like this between out and in. This angle is equal to 90 degrees. That's what we call the critical angle. So if you write an equation, n1 times the sine of the critical angle supposed to be equal to n2 times the sine of 90 degrees. That's it. The sine of 90 equals what? 1. So this ratio always gives us a way to calculate the critical angle for these two media. And uh, I've got the picture. Now, nowadays, we have actually very important practical application of that. Fiber optics. how it looks like. See? Light travels through this transparent guide, light guide, travels through. Of course, uh, an actual uh, fiber optical wire, it, well, first of all, it's circular and uh, much thinner, but light. But the principle is physical principle is exactly the same. <coughs> light rays enter the fi fiber optical wire, but because of the total internal reflection, they cannot get out. They get reflected from the surface. <coughs> and uh, well, of course, eventually energy dies out, but uh, there's an amplifier every several that depends, kilometers, and uh, 
That's how fires work. That's it. Now, uh, we could actually try it at home if you had a bulb, to place it and look at it from above. In this situation, what is happening? Well, <clears throat> from a bulb, light in water travels in all possible directions. However, when the angle becomes above critical, it can't get out. So when a person is looking down in this situation, that the bulb. So what's happening? Well, of course, this ray travels out. No problem at all. It doesn't bend at all. Let's say we have a ray which travels away from a bulb and reaching this point of a surface. Well, so what should we do? We should draw a normal. This will be the angle of incidence. And, uh, well, if this angle is less than critical, some light will be traveling in the air and reaching the eye, and we see bright spot. Now, there is critical angle. Let's say this is a critical angle. For this angle, okay, uh, there is no refraction anymore. And for all light rays above this angle, they just get, get reflected back in water. This is what we call total internal reflection. So this is refraction reflection so this will be this will be that radius of a circle we are looking for beyond that point there will be no light traveling out and of course this now is just a geometrical problem this equals one meter r is what we're looking for in this right angle triangle. So this and this is the same angle, critical angle, theta critical. And uh, this is the first medium. This is the second, second medium. And uh, the sine of a critical angle is supposed to be equal to N2 divided by N1. We could do some geometry and algebra combined and solve this problem without using any numbers. But the fastest way is just use numbers. So uh, this equation tells us how to calculate the angle, a critical angle, critical angle, which is theta 1 for this situation. And if we know critical angle, the radius we are looking for divided by the, well, how deep, how much deeper the bulb is than the surface is. That's supposed to be equal to the tangent of this angle. That's it. And you know what it means. It means we're moving on. Now I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes to talk about other very important practical applications. We know that an eye is a conversion device. And uh, that's why we can see virtual images. When we look in the mirror, we look at the virtual image because this lens converges light. Where? Well, if we want to see a sharp image, the light's supposed to be converged on the retina here. If it's not 
there, the image is blurred. And, uh, <clears throat> well, the healthy eye can focus on uh, objects practically from about 25 centimeters to infinity. For not healthy eye, that's not always the case. For example, people like me, we need glasses. Why? Well, because when an object is far, farther than a critical point where I can focus on, the image of that object is not on the retina anymore. It's in front of it. But of course, light doesn't stop here. Yeah. Rays go to the retina. But that image becomes okay, blurry. And uh, how do we fix it? Well, simple. I want these rays slightly diverge. That's why we use a diversion lens. So, and this is already an optical system, not just optical device, two, two devices. And if we want to calculate the optical power, we just have to add, well, that's supposed to be close to the optical power of a healthy eye. This is an, uh, of an actual eye. And uh, we just, well, of course, we don't calculate. If you go to an optometrist, they don't do mathematics. They have a device which they use. The people who invented the device, they did physics and they did mathematics. Now, in opposite situation, <clears throat> and I cannot focus on objects which are close. It's uh, the image, the sharp image is behind the retina. So what do we do now? We want to extra converge these rays. That's why we use a conversion lens. And uh, well, again, we want to make the total power close to a power of a healthy eye. That's it. Of course, in reality, this is not an exact equation. But the closer the lens, the glass lens is to the eye, the more accurate this equation is. And uh, technically, uh, the contact lens would work much better than this, but it has other issues you know, like dirt. <clears throat> and uh, before we move on, any optical device is based on a combination of uh, properties of individual devices. So basically what is happening here, the lens first forms an image, and then this lens uses that image as the object for itself. And we can have more and more devices. And of course, the most common one is spyglass or a telescope. It has, at minimum, two lenses or a lens and a mirror. Uh, this is the model, one lens, second lens. Of course, you could, you could make an adjustment, but if you do it like this, the optical system actually has three elements, one, two, three. <laughs> and the same with mirrors. You know, if you go to a amusement park, there's a room so, which uses curved mirrors. Uh, this is one of the examples. Here, I have two mirrors. So. And an object, tiny piggy, works for free. So now one mirror forms an image, which becomes an object for a second mirror. And then that image becomes an object for my eye. And when I look at it, it looks like the piggy is right here. I want to grab it, but I can't. Try it. And uh, you can pass it around. So the general idea for every situation like that is simple. Yeah. We have to draw several ray diagrams in a row. We're not going to do that. It just, you know, if we wanted to, we could have. One device produces an image. That an image becomes an object for the second device. It produces its own image. That an image becomes an object for the third device. 
etc., etc. And people have developed powerful telescopes, microscopes, using this simple principle. Now, we have seen this slide. Actually, you know what? I've got one more. You can mow it. Yeah, let's have some fun. All I want to do is have some fun. I've got a feeling I'm not the only one. <clears throat> now, we've seen this slide. And uh, it tells us that depending on uh, what phenomenon we study, we look at light differently. For a simple phenomena like reflection, refraction, we treat light like uh, many, many tiny particles traveling away. But there are more complicated phenomena which cannot, can, cannot be explained by the particle nature of light. So to explain those phenomena, we start treating light as waves. And we know a lot of things about waves already. So of course, those waves travel from sources in all possible directions. They might be absorbed or reflected, and uh, depending on wave of which wavelength reaches eye, we see different colors. There is a spectrum, visible spectrum, from red to blue. And uh, we know that if we have two sources, we can generate a standing wave between two speakers, there is a wave, but the principle shouldn't work only for sound, it should work for any waves. And it shouldn't work only for sources facing each other. It should work for a region. Let's say we take those two speakers and uh, turn them. In that case, we should generate a standing wave, two-dimensional or even three-dimensional standing wave in certain space. So that's what we're going to talk about, the properties of standing waves generated by two coherent sources. Well, again, the idea is simple. We know what one source does. It generates, if it's a point, Source, it generates spherical waves traveling away in all directions. We know what the second source does. So basically, this is what we need to do. Just put the pictures together. And let's do it. We can look at the situation using first a simple model. Where can I generate waves? Well, for example, on the surface of lake or pool or anything with water. All I need is a source. Actually, Doppler effect. <clears throat> so one source, spherical waves, second source, Spherical waves. Now I gotta do. Did you catch it? <clears throat> we kind of get an idea, but it's really hard to see because to see an actual interference, we would need a larger pool. Faster, uh, faster moving sources. So we use a model. One source, second source. Here, we can see how they overlap. So these lines represent fronts. First front, second, third. So sequence of fronts travel away. And here, what's happening here? Well, we know what should be happening 
there's displacement number one, there's displacement number two, the actual displacement is first plus second. So here we, we may have a situation when both waves have displacement up, crests. In that case, the resultant also is up. And uh, well, we know what should happen when we have two speakers with waves traveling toward each other. See? Right in the middle, we should have always an antinode. That represents the maximum of intensity of a standing wave. Intensity of what? If it's sound, intensity of sound. If it's light, intensity of light. So for the sound, if we would walk, we would hear something like this. <laughs> maximum of intensity, nothing. In physics, nothing we call minimum. Then maximum, then minimum. So in this situation, we got to observe exactly the same behavior. We don't have to be there. We can walk here. Still, we should observe exactly the same change in the mac in, in, in intensity. Yeah, we walk. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Nightmares forever. Of course, now we got to find a way to describe it mathematically. We need to know how to find the exact location for the maximum of intensity and how to find the exact location for the minimum of intensity. But before that, remember these two speakers. I want you to hear that intensity does change indeed. So I just need to turn them to you. Now, you can try to move left or right. The motion is relative. So instead of making you move, I can move the speaker left or right. Closer to you, away from you. And of course, this room is awful for this experiment. Too much echo, too much reflection from everything. Well, this room is generally awful. <coughs> My room is much better. But you can see that intensity depends on the location where wave meet relative to the location of the sources. Well, mathematics, okay. Ah. This is actually a handy uh, simulation. Here we have uh, two f sources making waves, and uh, the color coding helps us to understand what is happening. Uh, we can move this point at different locations, and uh, stop. And we can play with frequency, with distances, frequency. And you can see that there is a point, come on, okay, like here, where nothing is happening at all. Right here, there is no motion at all. Or here, or here. Here, yeah, we can see dark red, dark blue, dark red, dark blue. So there are two different dark black locations. This, where it dark just momentarily, but change is happening. And uh, here, where it's always dark. So this means right here, there is no wave at all. Uh, 
and uh, all those lines, all those locations, we call uh, locations of a minimum of intensity. Well, It's very important to be able to visualize what's happening. So we have two waves. One wave travels this way, second wave travels this way. But uh, <coughs> when we look at the wave like this, we don't really see um, where two crests or a crest and a throw overlap. If, if we want to look from above, we don't see the wave at all. So that's where we use a color coding. So in this wave, the crest, crests mark by red color, throws by blue color. But now I don't really need a wave anymore. All I need to see is red, blue, red, blue. And this point is dark. That's where the equilibrium is located. So now all I need is two waves. One wave travels from a first source. Could have been a speaker or anything else. Here. Well, all, so wave travels in all directions, of course, but I, I need only one to see what's happening. Here I have a second source, second source. So again, from this source, Waves travel in all possible directions. And somewhere here, let's say they overlap. <coughs> and uh, this is a photograph, an instantaneous snapshot of these waves. So one wave travels like this. Yeah, we can throw, equilibrium, crest, equilibrium, throw, equilibrium, crest, equilibrium. That's why I used color coding. Same here. Well, actually, they have to be in phase. So they have to start from the same. All right. So throw, equilibrium, crest, equilibrium, throw, equilibrium, crest, equilibrium, two waves. Now, what's happening? Uh, say here. From this wave, we should see a throw. And from this wave, we should see a crest. We actually have symbols for those di uh, directions. For the direction down, we have a symbol like this. That represents the <sighs> instantaneous displacement. Okay, where is it? Okay, the instantaneous displacement of this wave at this location, but. Uh, here, we probably should do it blue to preserve my color cutting. At the same time, we should have we should have a displacement up. And if these waves are coherent, have the same frequency, have the same amplitude, vector up and vector down. What should they do to each other? They should cancel each other out. That's how we can now analyze each point in the whole region. So right here, we actually should observe nothing, what we call a minimum of intensity. So this location represents a minimum. When should we have a maximum? We have two options for the maximum. When they both point up or at simultaneously both point down. So uh, when would they both point up? Well, it should be blue and blue, uh, something like this. Uh, now, that's down, both point down. So blue and blue, two displacements down. So here we should have down and down 
y1, y2. So y equals 1, y1 plus y2. That should represent a maximum. Not for sale. Make yourself, <coughs> make your own. So, and now you can, of course, do more and more and more exploration. And you can see we should have locations where nothing is happening. Waves cancel each other out. We call it that we say here destructive interference is happening. Here constructive interference is happening. And of course, there's something in between. Those points, not interesting. So we don't talk about those. We only talk about points when nothing is happening or oscillations wave happens with maximum possible amplitude. So if that would be a sound wave, a person here would hear the loudest sound. A person here wouldn't hear anything at all. And uh, if you walk from here to here, it gets louder and louder. Then to the next minimum, go to zero, then to the next maximum, etc., etc. Now, <clears throat> how do we find all those locations? Well, we actually know how to do it because we know here we should have a standing wave with the maximum right in the middle. Maximum. And what's to the left and to the right, to the maximum? Nothing, yeah, a minimum. And what this distance should be equal to? From a maximum to the nearest minimum. Hmm? Now a quarter, a quarter of a wavelength. And then the next maximum, the next, well, actually, again, I probably should use it. So the next, it is a maximum just opposite to the first one. We've done it before, so nothing new, et cetera, et cetera. A minimum, a maximum, a minimum. A maximum, etc., 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 and of course, why do we have a maximum here? Because two waves in phase travel and reach in phase already. So, uh, yeah, my scale doesn't fit this one. All right, but that supposed to happen anywhere on this line, as long as distance traveled the same, we should observe the maximum of intensity. So this is not just a point. That's the whole line, well, all directions. Here, 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 here. You should observe maximum of intensity. What about the minimum? Again, it's not just one point. It's supposed to be the whole line. Let's say this one. Well, it's not to a scale. This probably should have been farther away. Uh, so all those lines can be found by this method. We just look at the region between because we know what's happening in between. And then all those lines, okay, maximum, yeah. I should have preserved next time, next year. <clears throat> now, mathematics. One wave travels to here, distance which we call, let's say, L1. Second wave travels to here, distance which we call L2. See, to reach this location where the minimum is happening, this 
wave should travel longer distance than this way. How much longer? If I want to calculate this difference. This is the path of the wave number one. This is the path of the wave number two. So this difference has a name. Path, length, difference. For this particular point, we know that this distance is equal to a quarter of a wavelength. So mathematically, this minus this will be equal to what? <coughs> so there is a, a person, an observer, an imaginary pe person who is everywhere at the same time, very powerful guy. So when that person is here listening or watching, that person shouldn't hear anything or see anything. Well, unfortunately, I'm not transparent. <laughs> but oh, that's I can do. Better? So the distance traveled from the first source to this point, to the location of this observer, that's uh, what we call, well, path. And it has a certain length, the second. And ag again, from this source, a wave travels to the same location, different distance. So different path, different distance. And if we subtract these two distances, that difference has a name, path, length, difference. Yes? Why do you have two maxima next to each other? I don't know the actual arrangement. I know that on both sides to the first maximum, I must have a minimum. Nothing. We used to call it node. But if I move a quarter of a wavelength from a node, I must reach, again, an anti-node, which now we call maximum, because relative to the observer, that should be a maximum intensity of a sound here, or he should observe maximum intensity of light here. But if we move another quarter of a wavelength, we should reach another location when there is nothing, and there are many locations like that with nothing. That's I don't understand. Because on the way right, your way right, you have a mass and an axis. Ah, this one. Yeah, yeah, I was just, I was just rushing. Yep, someone pays attention. Black, blue, black, red, black, blue, etc., etc. Yeah. So, this is a very important part of the reasoning. What number should I write? Or expression. The distance traveled from here to here minus the distance traveled from here to here is equal to. I wish I had candies. First person who would give the right answer would get the candy. I can't give extra credit. So what should I write? Anyone. Quarter. Ron. Try again. There's the same distance traveled, would have been traveled from this source to which point? If I would measure the same distance, but from this source, where would I stop? Here? 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 
here. This distance from here to the minimum, which is the nearest to the center. So that would have been that would have been the same distance which we called L1, because it would have been again from the source to the minimum, the nearest to the max, to the center. And the difference between these two is this. So it's not a quarter, it's two quarters or a wavelength. And now, <clears throat> if I go to any point on this line, and if I calculate this, well, this is a new length number one. This is a new length number two. But if I calculate the difference, I'm going to get exactly the same result again and again and again and again for this line. For this line, for this whole line, the path length difference is a half of a wavelength. And on this line, waves always kill each other. On this line, nothing is happening. Never. Well, <clears throat> There's another, there's another line like that, this one. Uh, the path length difference, which is <coughs> technically now is L1 minus L2, but we always use magnitudes, so L2 minus L1, 1 minus L2, still will be equal to a half of a wavelength. Now, what's going to, um, okay, what's going to happen if we repeat exactly the same reasoning for the next minimum. So here, 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 here. L2, L1. The path length difference should be equal to what? Well. We need to find the difference between these two. The difference will be the same for all. <clears throat> and uh, for this line, the path length difference will be equal to, what do you say? And that's part of this geometry. So that the second minimum from the central first, second, the second minimum from the central. So this is what we're looking for. One, two, three, four. Maximum minimum. First, second. Is my picture correct? But I know what I have to get in the end. Quarter, first minimum, maximum, second minimum. Quarter, first minimum, maximum, second minimum. That should be three and uh, half.
one half, three halves, three halves. One half, second half, three halves. That's how <coughs> I want to write it down in terms of halves. Um, because if we had time and if we could move to the next maximum and to the next maximum, or to the next minimum and to the next minimum, I do minimum first. The pattern would have been, emergent pattern would have been one half, three halves, five halves seven halves, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so when the path length difference will be equal to an odd number of halves, at that location, we should observe nothing. Maximum much easier. For the maximum here, there is no path length difference. For the next maximum, <clears throat> that would be Maximum that would have been just exactly three wavelengths. So, <clears throat> of course, I've got all these slides handy. All right, so that's when we observe different type of interference, constructive, destructive. Another representation of the same fact, when should we observe a constructive interference and a destructive interference, which we call minimum intensity, maximum intensity. That's what we know for the middle line, always maximum. Now, <clears throat> for the minimum, we uh, did draw some pictures. For the maximum, we did draw some pictures. And uh, as the result, for any interference pattern, we only have these uh, options. Oops. Can I draw it here? No, I can't. All right. I don't know why. And uh, <clears throat> The result depends on the path length difference and to observe a maximum of intensity at certain location, the constructive interference, we need to be able to fit a whole number, a natural number of wavelengths in the path length difference or to observe a destructive interference, a minimum of intensity, we need to be able, well, this is how people write it in mathematics, but if you multiply by 2, divide by 2, that will give you an odd number, an odd number of halves of the wavelength. All right, <clears throat> I'm going to pick up from this tomorrow. So this slide just is the summary of everything I've done this slide. And uh, this is what we call conditions. The conditions for the maximum, the conditions for the minimum of intensity. Thank you. There's another little piggy somewhere. Let's bring it back. Good morning.